Welcome all to what's actually going to be our final discussion for uh, the uh, five-week pivoting online course. We've covered some pretty significant territory during that time, had lots of interesting discussions in the discussion forum, and we've had a mess of interviews with people from around the world that are experts, if you will, in the online experience, either moving online, the research behind it, the practice of it, and so on. So I think we've covered some pretty significant territory during that time. What we want to do now, I guess, is we're getting into our fifth week where we're looking at a number of things which isn't just coming back to the classroom. If you remember many years ago, back in March, when we started talking about how we wanted to have the fifth week focus on getting back into the campus come fall. And it's looking like getting back onto campus isn't going to be the primary motivator because I think a number of schools already have called the semester and a few more, no doubt, will call it going forward, which means that it's likely about more longer term focus planning in the online environment and so on. So why don't we just start with a quick overview of uh, how you all are doing, what's going on, and anything interesting that you've noticed. Why don't we begin with you, Tanya? Alrighty. Um, well, you know, it's just interesting times. And so I've been joining in on the online learning consortiums, ID8 virtual live sessions that they've been having. Um, they started yesterday. They're continuing this week and next week. So they're um, facilitated live discussions around certain topics. There's about 100 people joining each hour. And so those have been very interesting in that it seems like one, people are doing the same thing they're doing in this course, looking for just-in-time solutions to how they uh, teach remotely. Two, what is interesting is some people are preparing to teach online, hopefully in a more strategic um, and planned way for the summer, and some for the fall as well. As you mentioned, I know Cal State Fullerton already announced that they'll be fully online in the fall. Um, I know that a lot of universities are looking to prepare for fully online, even though they're, they haven't necessarily called it. I think there's another group of people, though, that are completely unaware that online is a very probable situation in the fall. So, um, so that's been very interesting that there's that work going on um, and that people are preparing. I think that's great. I think it's a little problematic that people are not potentially preparing to be fully online in the fall. And then I think also what's interesting as we prepare to be fully online in the fall is that I know I just heard um, about uh, furloughs at the Medical College of Wisconsin. 700 people were just furloughed uh, for the summer. I know at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, they just announced yesterday that even those working remotely that are not mission critical will be furloughed. I've heard the same for University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. So we are hearing about hundreds, uh, probably thousands of folks in higher education that will be furloughed. Disappointingly is that we're hearing about people being furloughed that are actually critical and could support um, quality online learning. So. It's interesting that, um, you know, in some ways, some folks are, um, you know, uh, George Valencianos just said a university in Canada was hiring 17 instructional designers, um, where you're hearing about, um, you know, VPs of online being uh, furloughed. So <laughs> um, some people have got it right, and some people do not have it right. So, um, you know, this is always interesting to see how it's, it's going to play out that sort of the stage of things. I'm very much like every university should be building a solid infrastructure to have quality online forever and making digital part of their strategic plan. But that's just me. <laughs> well, Tanya, I wonder if I can just uh, flesh that out a little bit because I, I agree with you, that's what they should be doing. The reality is, I, I, and you've seen this, and Wisconsin is also susceptible, but University of Michigan this week said that they're uh, down something in the range of $400 million to $1 billion this yeah. year. And so strategy is perhaps different when you're facing that kind yeah. of, it's, it's the idea or the concept of carnage. Like, you know, what do you do in this kind of a setting? So I'm a little concerned about what that's going to end up looking like and whether universities can think strategically when they're really facing an existential crisis. Because, and I think some systems are. And what's yeah. concerning to me is that 
the full scope of the impact is still unknown. States are withdrawing pre-existing funds that they've committed. Uh, universities that have exposure to 30, 40% of the international population are facing challenges. And this isn't just in the US. Yesterday during our chat uh, with Dave, I mentioned that University of Winnipeg or University of Manitoba was asked by the government to plan 10, 20, and 30% reductions. Once you're down to, given how far we've cut since the 2008 financial crisis, we've become much more leaner. The expectation now, like when you cut 10%, you're getting into faculty and 20% and 30%. Like it's, you, you're, you, everything you're cutting as lean as many universities have become, start to become mission critical. So I don't know, I appreciate sort of your thoughts on what, how would a university that's facing a $1 billion shortfall, uh, you know, address that? Hiring 20 instructional designers is at best putting on a small Band-Aid yeah well you know i there's two um phases to this um personally i think it's a good time um and it's not going to be pleasant and this is not the favorable you know i see what the wisconsin system is doing and trying to furlough as many as they can um, by not having to furlough faculty and still possibly in the fall conduct business as usual but fully online Personally, I think this is a time um, in particular when you mentioned, George, which a lot of people don't understand, um, every state is, um, is in the hole. States are requesting money from the federal government. We're talking billions of, of dollars in order to make up for losses. So it's not just that the universities are, are in the hole, the states themselves are in the hole. Um, and we're seeing, like George had mentioned, um, reduction in commitment to the university systems. And so that I actually was just talking with Becky from the Chronicle last week because I don't think people realize that you know the state can't make up the money. There's no money there to make up for for the losses. And so what probably should have been happening a long time ago is what we tend to do is we tend to scrape off 10%. You know, and I've been going through cuts for 15 years, but you know it's like everyone cut 15%, you know, or 10%, and um, and so forth, but we haven't really been cutting out um, the fat. We've just been, everyone has to trim. Even if you're a successful unit, you have to trim. And we've been trying to not cut um, academic units. We've just been trying to trim them. And I think it's time that we really start looking at higher ed and thinking about where we can more strategically cut. Where are the loss, you know, not just thin everything out, we're gonna have to seriously cut. We're gonna have to um, cut programs. There are certain academic programs that probably should have been merged years ago, um, departments and, um, and schools and colleges that were not. Um, there's universities that potentially will need to be closing um, in uh, state systems, and, and we've already seen a reduction of that to some point. You know, the UW colleges, the two-year system um, was merged with four-year campuses with actually little discussion with, you know, if anybody really wanted that um, in some sort of strategic way. So um, I'm really tired of everyone has to cut or the non-academic units who support instruction have to be cut, like my old unit was cut several times. But instead, we need to really think about what does the future of higher ed look like? Where can we and where do we need to right now allocate resources and where do we need to seriously cut? Um, and it's not gonna be fun, I get it. Um, and I know we're all really reluctant to cut faculty lines or academic programs, but it's just the, the state of where we are. And, and like George, you were mentioning, I mean, we were 37 million short walking into this before the pandemic. Okay, <laughs> now we're at least over 100 million in the hole walking into the fall without money earned from housing, parking, and so forth. I know for uh, you know those of us with residential campuses, it's going to be problematic. We do have um, a you know a nice uh, successful amount of online programming and online infrastructure, but again, our university hasn't invested in it in the way that it should have for the last decade, and I'm. And that's what I was alluding to in that digital should always, you know, it just should be part of moving forward, whatever aspect, because we don't, you know, the future is uncertain. Um, what we do know is that pandemics happen, climate change happens, 
Um, there's no reason that we cannot be teaching effectively and efficiently using digital mediums. So um, it's not business as usual. It's time to truly rethink. So, anyway, and I, I mean, I want to dig deeper on this, and I, I don't want to just pick on you. So I'm going to just throw this out randomly to anybody who's interested. But what I find is we are approaching this like it's a logical situation. Meaning oh, that, yeah. <laughs> you know, now is the time to reevaluate and become the kind of university that we want to do. I think we're more like a company that is entering receivership or bankruptcy or whatever you want to call it. And the decisions to be made are not going to be made on what's best systemically, what's best logically. The decisions that are going to be made, and, and I said this in the chat with Dave yesterday, is the only line that matters right now are state budget lines in the US. That is the only thing that matters because there will be no logic around do we invest in learning designers? Do we keep these faculties? Do we invest in teaching and learning centers? All of those are gonna be dictated and driven by what's happening at state budget coffers, at least in the US, and they are imploding. Uh, Australia, absolute carnage in the higher education sector. I've said this a few times, but they're talking 21,000 positions lost in Australia, which is roughly the population of Texas, just to put it into context. So uh, I'm, I'm worried that this is not a logic situa logical situation. We think it's logical and we're not paying enough attention to the one line that matters above all else, which is what's happening economically. And beca because like I said, states that have already allocated dollars are clawing back from the university sector. Yes, some systems like Canada and like UK and like Australia have a little more centralized support, but even then that's gonna run six months. You know, Australia can only announce so many $9 billion initiatives before they run out of budget. Because at the end of the day, the initiatives they're announcing are tied to the prospect of a rebounding economy. So on that happy note, I'm opening it up to anybody, Justin, Matt, and Hagen, uh, any thoughts or reflections, uh, just so I don't feel like I'm picking on Tanya. or talk about something else. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, I mean, it's interesting to watch because it's actually different across everywhere, really. And it's, you've got the range from um, universities who are really struggling financially, um, who are in debt. Um, and the only way out of it is to to cut. Um, so you're looking at their budget and it's looking at, well, where are we going to cut? Are we going to cut at the leadership level, at the senior leadership level? Are we going to cut, um, you know, our casual staff? Um, where are we going to cut? What, and each university is going to take their own take on it, depending on where their priorities lie. So some universities might be more research focused, so they might protect the research staff. Some might be more teaching focused and might protect the teaching staff. So it's the full, it's, it's the range. And then some universities, just happened to not be in debt. They weren't planning large infrastructure changes that they now can't do, for example. Or, um, you know, international student dollars plays a large role in here as well. Um, some universities rely quite heavily on that income from, you know, international students, which um, may have shifted now, um, while other ones didn't have as, they weren't relying as much, so aren't as affected. Um, in Australia in particular, the international student market has been affected, um, given that this whole crisis um, was parallel to when coronavirus just started. So um, it's had a huge hit just from the international student market, which again, some universities have felt more than others. Um, and so I suppose their direction of what they're going to be doing has shifted and changed. Um, I find it frustrating um, when I hear about cuts happening particularly in support areas for online learning and teaching when we're in this massive time of shifting to online learning and teaching. If we were shifting face to face, um, then I can understand maybe, maybe cutting some in that area, but it's the complete reverse. This is the time, and we've been saying this for the past six to eight weeks, this is the time where universities have the opportunity to think about how they're going to shift online. Um, and it's the opportunity for people who are in online learning and ed tech and pedagogy in general um, to be able to bring their experiences and their research and everything together in order to help the universities go towards that direction because they have to. Um, 
So it is frustrating when you hear that. It's frustrating when you see um, companies try to get in on the market. Um, and that's probably happening everywhere um, where you see companies trying to dive into this field of opportunity and say, oh, you need to shift online. How about we help you? We'll forget about the fact that you actually have 30 fantastic people who could probably do it. We can do it, we can do it quicker. So if you want it quicker, we'll help you. Um, because obviously you may not want your other staff who are doing everything else um, for your university and are under time pressure and everything else for the rest of the campus um, to, to do more work. So um, I think a lot of private companies are taking this opportune time to get into the universities, um, which is also frustrating to see um, as somebody who works within the university rather than external to it. Um, so that's some of the things. Um, I was looking at the discussion forums just quickly before this. Um, and I think a number of people have shared their ed tech journeys, um, which was nice to read. And a bit of a theme that came through out of them was um, experience as an online learner um, in supporting teaching online. And it is nice to see. And it's, I mean, if you think about it, we all, a lot of us, well, say most people have grown up learning face-to-face. -face. Um, and so you take from those good and poor experiences learning face-to-face -face as you then adapt and teach face to face yourself. So similarly, having an experience um, learning online gives you the opportunity to take the good and the poor from your online learning experiences and shape that into um, your own online teaching experiences. So um, opportunities like this MOOC and other opportunities that are out there um, allow and give that opportunity for people who haven't had previous online learning experience to have that. So it was nice to see that that bit of theme was coming through from those who were sharing their ed tech journeys that they had um, prior experience as an online learner prior to jumping into um, online teaching. All right, Justin, Matt, uh, feel free to shift to any topic. Um, what's been on your mind last week? I don't want to leave oh. this topic. <laughs> um, so I'm jumping in because now I'm like, no, George, everything is logical. I can't understand a statement that this is not logical. Like, um, you know, my brain is like 99% logical. Everything else I don't understand. Although I am trying to get in touch with my feelings lately, but that's not working out for me. So anyways, moving forward. So if we talk about logic and we have all of these cuts, um, you know, and we talk about backwards design, I think of and everything else or even um, backwards engineering, but like what stays then? You know what I'm saying? So um, I think there is logic to it. And I think that we can identify areas of the university, but um, Megan got me thinking when she talked about research, because I know the medical college, the majority of those um, 700 um, folks that were furloughed were researchers in lab settings. Um, so that's really interesting. So just, you know, I think that there are, there are departments and units on campuses that are already doing a great job at successfully offering quality online programs. And I think that those will continue. Um, I think that there is going to be a research question mark, although research brings hundreds of thousands of dollars to my university. We're a research one university, but we're also broad access um, I can see um, research, depending on the type of research, you know, possibly being a new limitation. If we're talking about the labs are closed, all the labs at our university are closed, um, Medical College of Wisconsin and so forth. So where, how do we generate those research dollars? And then I started to think as um, folks were talking in the chat here, um, uh, somebody had brought up, um, you know, private colleges and so forth, you know, we're already hearing reports of lower enrollments. Um, you know, they're doing market research, people are taking gap years, all of that sort of stuff. I'm hearing from faculty at all different colleges that are saying that they, um, their courses aren't full because, you know, registration's already open. So now we're looking at, you know, what do we do with research here? What do we do? Um, are the online programs and courses that exist going to continue to, to sustain their enrollment? Or are we gonna see decreased enrollment because that's gonna even have a bigger thing? I'm not going anywhere with this. I'm just in my mind um, brainstorming backwards, like what, what does exist in, um, as we move forward and what doesn't? You know, Things like Negan had mentioned research where I'm like, 
you know, a lot of our research dollars come in include physical labs. How does that work? Although, you know, I think you can social distance in some of those, but um, it, you know, it'll be really interesting. I know too, at some of the universities I've talked to, they're getting rid of large enrollment courses. It's a safety issue. You can't put over 50 students in a tin can um, come fall. Uh, you know, so, you know, 400 students in a large lecture, those might never exist in the near future. And those are money makers for some departments. I was talking with um, Brokansky on Twitter, uh, Michelle Pokansky Brock, about that and issues with access and equality in those anyways. Um, so anyways, I'm just brainstorming out loud here, but there's lots of, you know, things popping in my mind. But everything's logical, think, George. <laughs> Don't freak me out. But I think one of the challenges here, and I want to throw this over to Matt, but one of the challenges that I'm seeing is let's look at a period where we actually had resources allocated to teaching innovation and learning technologies. Sadly, for many systems, that was the MOOC age. Um, that was the only time that universities and departments got 5, 10, 20, 50 million dollars allocated. I know UT System paid something in that range to, you know, to join U, uh, edX. I know University of Michigan invested enormously in it as well. Michigan is one of those universities that's done a fantastic job driving that for ongoing enrollment. But who, nobody's getting $50 million now. And you look at the minimal impact that the $50 million investment had. Um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just trying to see it from that lens is there is a massive systemic reorganization coming and we are not in charge of that reorganization. The presidents are not in charge of that reorganization. The governors are and the economy is. So we can do some rearranging, but in the middle of a hurricane, that new curtain in the front window may not be significant to help us weather the storm. Um, but I'm going to throw it over to Matt. I, and I think, I mean, I appreciate what you're saying. And I wish you were right, Tanya. I wish this was logical. Um, I just see it. It's like we're having a conversation about everything but the main thing. And the main thing is 100% what's going on economically. And that'll filter through everything. But Matt, now that we're almost halfway through our discussion today, how are you doing? Um, wow. Wow. Um... Uh, you're in the headlights here. Let's see. Um, no, you know, something else I want to throw in there are the main thing is going to be the students. And if they're going to start suing their universities for their online stuff, they're going to start saying, I'm not going to go to the online stuff. Uh, that's going to get a lot of people's attention. And then uh, what's going to happen is all these other students are going to say, hey, I've been doing online. It's been great. What are you complaining about? I think there's going to be a forced conversation about the quality of online learning at some point. Maybe not be the big thing that everyone looks at, but it's going to be forced at some point. And you're going to find out that a lot of our administrators don't understand that online learning is an entire field of, of you know, an entire discipline, you know, uh, or, you know, a collection of disciplines that has to be, you know, well prepared, well thought out, you know, and put some time into it. But um, I, I think we're, you know, because your students are, were, you know, they, without your students, you can get all the funding you want to, uh, but then no one shows up for your class, you know. So I think that's going to, that's going to be a huge driver. And I've been seeing that a lot out there. There's already some lawsuits that are being leveled. There's uh, a lot of protests, you know, students saying they're going to take gap years if someone that, or you know, not come back for years, they noticed in the comments. I think that's going to be, I think that's going to get some attention. I think that's going to drive some of the conversation. Maybe not this week or next week, but I think you're going to see it uh, emerging a lot more as the students say, you know, my own son, he's, he's nine years old. He's already complaining about how do I get out of these Zoom sessions? You know, I tweeted about that this morning. I mean, being well prepared for the, the you know, future of the work world, why that, you know, but he just, he doesn't even want to go, you know, because he's already tired of it. We're going to start hearing more of that. That's, and I'm seeing that. I think that's going to change some conversations out there. Maybe not for the good in some places, but, you know, I, I think um, uh, I've had a lot of Twitter activity this past two days. Uh, this time positive, but um, I forget who said it, but someone made this point about you're going to see a differentiation between uh, those uh, systems that are actually going to uh, invest in um, 
and online learning experts and those that are going to fire them. And you're going to see a big, you're going to, you're going to see a big difference between those two and that's going to get noticed, especially by students. So how, how long do you think until you notice that difference? Cause I, I mean, I look at systems like UPenn that, you know, they had 15 years ago, they had a hundred learning designers on staff with their global campus and they were aggressive leads and uh, you know, I'm not sure how they differentiate now compared to other universities that have more recently gotten into. If you look at your Harvards and MITs, they only paid attention to the digital technology space for learning in a significant way when they launched their own startups in the form of edX and Coursera. So I'm curious, and I don't disagree, but I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on how long until that differentiation will be noticed by students or by faculty or others. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you know, honestly, we don't always do a good job of listening to our students in higher ed. So the students are already noticing it. Um, it's going to take a while and they're probably going to some, uh, you know, lawsuits, protests, who knows what, to get their voices heard. It could take some time and not be as, as fast as we need it to, to, uh, to improve things by the fall. But I think we're going to see a pretty big mess in the fall. Because you're going to have, you know, Texas is already trying to open up everything, not everything, but too many things, and a horrible idea, but they're going forward with it. You have other people are saying that they're going to wait. Uh, you have people that are going to put a lot of faith in social distancing, so you have this whole society that's going to be this mess of coming back and staying, and then our, our campuses are going to be the same thing as well. So it, it's just, I think it's just going to be a mess in the fall, probably with very, it's going to be hard to pick out good trends because it's just going to be a mess because you know it's, it's, it's just i mean we have very bad leadership at very many levels all the way up to the top here in the states at least so uh, i mean you know a, a lot of this if, if if we had a more um stable uh political uh genius on top of us uh we could maybe talk about this a lot easier but even then it's hard to predict what someone's tweet is going to do for as far as uh, societal chaos in the future as well. So. Yeah, I, I'm seeing a vote for Matt campaign start in the chat <laughs> forum. Don't worry, Matt, you got my vote, man. Um, oh, Justin, Justin, what about you? How's, uh, what's on your mind these days and what are you noticing? Um, a lot of stressed out faculty. Um, things are starting to blow up a bit. Um, they're trying to figure things out, and especially uh, summer terms coming up pretty soon. Uh, May master is a summer term, and um, it's sort of like, well, I had to panic and get stuff online in a hurry here, and things didn't go as well as I liked, and some students had some discontent and things like that. Now, now I have to teach now summer term, and, and what's that going to look like? And do I have time to adequately plan for it? And you know, what are some things we can try? And trying to help support that, and then even talking to some other um, people today. Um, like, I feel like everything takes two times as long right now, too. It's just the number of hours in the day. Like, it's taking me longer to grade. It's taking me longer to communicate with students. It's taking, so um, feelings of exha exhaustion on top of everything else that, you know, they're, they're dealing with, you know, right now um, is, 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 is a big challenge. And then, and then the other one I was having a conversation, too, is um, research, too. They're like, how on earth am I, I need to get grants out? I mean, I'm going to be evaluated. I'm on the tenure track and I'm supposed to be applying for these grants, I'm supposed to be getting these publications out, and like, what's that going to look like on my dossier when I'm trying to submit this in a year? And um, I, I mean, are, are we going to, I mean, I'm assuming you would hope, logically, that administrators and, and others that are gonna be in these decision-making positions are going to consider this, but it's a good question mark, and, and I understand why people are fearful of it. And, um, and, and I know that, Heck, I'm in that position too. Holy cow. It's like my research project to ground to a halt. <laughs> I'm trying, <laughs> trying to get papers out and things, but wow, it is, it is hard. It is, it is a big difficult thing. So, um, you know, I think that that's something we have to continue to be cognizant of right now. Um, you know, again, this is someone that's helping support faculty. It's, you know, trying to encourage them, like, just keep, you know, keep moving on, keep trying it and, and being willing to iterate and being willing to, to abandon, you know, if you need to abandon something, drop it. If you can, if it's possible, and it's not working, we have a couple weeks left, you're almost there, you know, do what you can. And then for summer, you know, if you can try something or even a couple things, you know, do that. You may not need to completely redesign your course, backward, you know, learning design and have all these good principles in place and all that. It, 
you know, if there's some things that you can take away from trainings that you've done or courses like this, yeah, absolutely. Take, you know, take, take that, try to use, try to experiment and implement. Cause I know that's one thing we talked about early on in one of these sessions is every one of us has had a journey. Every one of us has made some mistakes in our teaching and, um, um, we've, we'll, we've all learned a lot from it and, um, you know, just encourage, uh, you that are watching this recording or in the session now to just, you know, keep, keep plugging along. I said, there's some really good things and some really good concepts. Hopefully that you can take away from this. Great. Well, thanks everybody for sort of a quick round of introductions that took half the discussion, which is uh, great to hear. I mean, these are obviously things that you're thinking about that you're aware of and that you're seeing. Um, I, we've said this right at the start at best. This is a two hump problem, which is do the emergency now plan later, but it's also becoming quite clear that this is a multi whatever you want to call it. It's not a month problem or a week problem. It's a months and years problem. And, uh, you know, the, the way it'll filter through is, is significant. If you look at it since the 2008 financial crisis, it was just this year that many states were beginning to report a return to the levels of funding from state levels that they had pre-2008, which means we were just kind of bouncing back. And by all indicators, depending on the length of time that this goes on, we should see uh, you know, a longer recovery cycle than that. So I think that presents sort of its own set of concerns. But with those happy thoughts out of the way, why don't we talk a little bit about what are you seeing that's working well? Uh, all of you are involved in different ways of dealing with faculty, dealing with students, but what's some good news that you guys are seeing? Well, I think what we're seeing is that people are realizing that um, long duration synchronous sessions are not working. And um, that was actually originally why I was talking from to Becky from the Chronicle last week. And, you know, a lot of emotional labor goes into these sessions. Like, do I look okay? Does everything look okay? Am I making eye contact with the computer and like being as charismatic and charming as I always am? Um, I don't know, you know, and so, um, you know, these synchronous sessions, I think, are almost more um, difficult because of all of the nonverbal and environmental cues that you have to keep track of, in addition to the crisis that is happening in our society that we're trying to block out and sort of do business as usual. So it's nice to see that people are moving beyond that. Um, as I've said before in the discussion, some of you guys just have amazing ideas about um, things that you can do. And, um, you know, I've been contacted now by some different folks that have, um, you know, found some of the more active learning, um, peer instruction, um, sorts of things, small group activities that the faculty um, are really liking those. And so it's great to see um, people who are new to online so quickly, um, realizing that there's some really great things that you can do um, as far as collaborative and student-centered and active learning in the online environment that works really well and that you can move beyond sort of this idea of long um, virtual sessions with no um, sort of return there. So it's good to see that. Um, I agree. I think. Um... You know, when you talk about that two hump approach, George, I think we're slowly starting to see people um, move towards that second hump now. Um, it was a lot originally of how do I get onto Zoom? How do I use Zoom and all the synchronous? And how do I move from my face to face tutorial to a synchronous tutorial? And that was where all our support just kind of just went into just because that was where the demand was. Um, and we wanted to, you know, be reactive to that. But now it's nice to see that it's, okay, that's settled down. And now people are thinking, okay, so if instead of a synchronous lecture, maybe I can just record some short videos for my students, what does that look like? Um, th we've got some faculty that are now starting to become interested around some of the principles around multimedia design and um, you know, what the research is saying around how to best design such videos and get, you know, become, make it engaging for students and that sort of thing, which is really nice to see because that means they're starting to at least mellow down a little bit with this online learning and start to actually consider different ways that they can present their material and start to question that and start to take time to do that. 
So it's nice to see that there's this um, starting to move to that second hump. Um, however, where we're at in Australia, we're just, um, we're still we're just part way through our first term, really. So when this hit, this was the beginning of our year, um, and we're part way through our first term, which means our faculty are now thinking about end of term exams. Um, so we're at that point right now where it's like, right, so our exams are online and frantic panic of how are we going to deal with that? Um, do we just move it on to an online quiz? Well, how, and we, you know, those of us who have done online quizzes, we know there's all sorts of elements around it. There's academic integrity questions to start thinking about. There's um, how to best design the quiz so you can reuse it again to think about settings, that sort of thing. Um, or do you just give students a, a paper that they download and upload? You know, there's so many different ways of doing it. Um, but this is now kind of that next thing. So we, I, I feel like we're in between the two humps. We need to get over that first term of moving to online exams. Um, I think once that happens, faculty will become more confident in that approach, more comfortable in that approach, um, just like we're starting to see them become more comfortable and confident in the online teaching space and start to think about different ways of doing that. Um, once we get through this first batch of online exams, I think we'll be able to, to move on from that. But um, I think we're starting, starting to just slowly climb that hump of that second, um, second hump coming up. On my end, I think one thing that's been encouraging is I've started to see people actually provide uh, assistance for graduate teaching assistance. I think that's been a segment of our uh, on-campus population that have not been provided the same sorts of service. I've noticed it at a number of institutions. So I've been seeing additional things on Twitter as well as even, said, even my institution, like, hey, wait a second. So I think we had um, a session even on our campus on Monday and we had a large number of students attend and it was really great to be able to share some good thoughts with them. So um, I think that that's just an important one going forward because often they teach a lot of those um, survey level or you know big large lecture level classes as well and if we're not providing targeted support to them either that's that's an important thing because a lot of times they may not even get that to begin with and then <laughs> they're forcing them to move into an online environment very quickly a lot of things can go bad in a hurry so um, that's just something i've been encouraged about lately So we're just talking in the chat just to bring um, other folks into the discussion. Um, somebody had mentioned just some things that they took out of this um, that were useful. So just to emphasize some of those. Um, I, what is, um, I, I don't see a first name here, but I know you're at UWM. Um, anyways, he had mentioned the interviews, um, enjoying the interviews, and I um, was just actually in a meeting this week and was recommending um, the use of interviews rather than just giving lectures and those sorts of things. I think interviews and having a discussion allows you to get deeper into topics. Um, they're more interesting and engaging to listen to, and I always, I'm a researcher, so I think everything's a data source. But I love interviews because then you can transcribe them and use them in different um, research that you're doing. So that's really um, exciting to hear and, and Megan had agreed with that. So if there's a way for you to develop content for the summer term or fall by interviewing some colleagues or experts in the field, that's a really great way to go. I think also uh, we were talking about, Amy was mentioning that you know she had identified some things that worked really well online and that she wants to keep those moving forward. And I think that gets back to a little bit about the blended learning we were talking about for this week. Um, and that there are gonna be, you know, when we had people early on come through our blended faculty development program, they always said like, I'll never teach face-to-face -face the same way again. Because you find out that certain things work really well online. Why would I wanna bring that back and, and try to do it face-to-face? -face? It just isn't gonna work as, as the same way. And that's really about blended is identifying what works really well online and what, you know, for example, like a certain art process or a certain science process that might need to be like a lab face to face. But I think definitely identifying those things in your course that work really well online and, you know, when we um, start blending um, more of the face to face environment, you know, feel free to keep those online activities as part of your course. 
just make sure to appropriately integrate your face-to-face -face and your online. Um, you just don't want it to seem like you're tacking on a face-to-face -face or you're tacking on an online. And now again, that's like pie in the sky dream because what we're going through right now, um, I think it's just doing the best that you can. But it's really great to see that some of you are understanding some of the advantages that the online uh, medium can bring to your teaching. That's awesome. Maybe one of the the questions to explore a bit with with uh, you know with all of you here is the there's been some conversation that as we move online uh, or back to classrooms eventually we're going to see a bit of a backlash to online learning because we all suffer kind of a collective uh, trauma from this forced onlining and the combining uh, experience that that has with obviously the quarantine and everything else that's going on where we've experienced some really dramatic disruptions to our personal uh, health to our emotional health and the list goes on. So what do you think? Let's say we are now 18 months down the road. We're starting fall 2021. And what do you think will have been the legacy of the cycle that we're in right now? Like, how do you, I agree with what you said, Tanya, that people go back into classrooms and once they've taught online, they realize there are certain things that just work better online than work in a classroom. By the same account, there's things that work much better in a classroom than work online. It's like we said right at the start, it's not that one medium is necessarily better than the other, but they're different. And success is different in each environment, meaning that some type of communication will work well in a classroom that won't work well online and vice versa. So just a quick run around the horn. What do you think will be the longer term legacy of the forced onlining uh, once we actually do get back into a blended or fully in person classroom? Uh, I probably should go last because I have a dystopian story. <laughs> I think one thing we will see a little bit of is that uh, people will move around uh, to get different jobs. They'll lose their jobs and have to move somewhere else. And some of, you, some of your students will say, I can't come back to the classroom uh, because I no longer live in the city. Uh, but if you're going to continue offering your courses online, I would probably still take them because I want to finish my degree. So you're going to have this, uh, you know, probably small subset, but definitely there, they will exist of students that are going to need to shift to online or just go to another university uh, completely online. So I think that is something that's probably going to, uh, maybe not for every college, but for certain colleges are going to have to grapple with that as well. Um, and because it's, uh, because we're going to have to uh, come back and deal with the societal upheaval as well. I think people are also going to be uh, very, um, I don't know, you know, even even when people say it's, it's safe to go outside, coronavirus doesn't exist in the world today, I'm probably still going to be staying well away from people. I'm going to be so like, trained you know, to just not go near people, not go near crowds, not do anything. It's like, I may not go back, even if, they, even if you know, uh, you know, every scientist in the world says, no, 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 it's safe. I, I, it may still take a while for me to just still go back to physical locations. I mean, it's... it's um, you know, it's, I, 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 I mean, even watching like old movies that I've seen before, I'm like, they're not social distancing. Oh, wait, no, that was like the 1800s. What am I saying? Um, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's just going to be this whole mindset that it, we're going to have to, I don't know, we're going to need collective counseling or something. I don't know. It, to even go back, we'll have to see. That's a good point. I do think that there is a collective social trauma that uh, we don't understand what it looks like yet. And what I, what I mean with that is that we, I, I don't think we appreciate yet the severity of what we're experiencing in terms of the longer term influence it'll have on just our wellness. Uh, what about, uh, let's see, I know Tanya said she's dystopian, so she wants to go last. Uh, Negan, Justin, what do you think is going to be some of the legacy implications of this? Well, 
Well, I think um, it's that whole, I mean, I think it's double. So for the, for the academics, the teachers, the instructors, it's, there's some of that going on in the chat at the moment. Um, well, what does it really look like as a teacher now? Um, do I just forget everything about this pivot to online and go back to what I was doing? Um, have my students changed? Um, is their attention span dropped or whatever? Or, you know, um, do they have different expectations now? It, um, it might probably will make some of our instructors realize, well, maybe there's certain things that I have done in this pivot to online that I can repurpose and reuse when I'm back in the face-to-face -face classroom. It brings up that whole topic of, you know, blended learning and, um, or flipped learning or however way they want to describe the mix of some face-to-face -face and online. Um, hopefully with some support as to what that actually looks like um, and what that means. However, um, then on the flip side of the students, I think it's going to change their experience as well. Um, I haven't met a lot of pe a lot of students who have studied online and um, have, you know, haven't really enjoyed it. And I don't mean this particular pivot to online, but you know, in structured online learning. So I would imagine that, you know, once we start moving into not this urgency of emergency online learning, but more structured online learning, that might be more thoughtful um, with, you know, organized strategic approaches to teaching online, students might start to appreciate some of that, appreciate the flexibility that that offers. If they're starting to go back into the workforce and whether that is full-time or part-time, having the opportunity to be able to continue their study online um, might be quite a draw for a lot of the students. They might want that, appreciate that, be able to keep doing that because, you know, whether we like it or not, online learning does bring a, a massive amount of flexibility to learning. It allows people to study at night or on the weekends or mix with whatever other um, uh, responsibilities that they have. So I think um, universities are going to grapple with that that's happening, that demand that students are starting to see, oh, well, you know, we did that online. Well, why can't we keep doing that online? Um, obviously not for pracs or labs or studio based as much, um, but certainly when it comes to tutorials and lectures that we can now are seeing, well, they, they can be online. Why make everyone show up at 9 a.m. or 5 p.m. on a Friday? You know, you've got other ways of doing it. Even um, exams that I was talking about before, once we are able to do them online in a way that handles all the academic integrity issues, et cetera, et cetera, then maybe people are gonna start looking at, well, why do we do this the way we have done it if it's working this other way? So I think um, it's going to be twofold, but I think at the end, if you look at the universities, it's the students that are will provide whatever demand it is, whether that's a demand more face-to-face, -face, a demand for more online, a demand of the blended, and our academics are going to have to start um, dealing with whichever demand comes their way. Take us into the abyss, Tanya. Oh, I was going to go towards. Okay. Oh, sorry, Justin. Go ahead, Justin. Oh, that's fine. I know we're running up short on time. I will keep it brief. So I just had a thought, um, you know, sort of thinking about this one again when this was going, that um, this idea of this return to normal, and I've heard a lot of people saying they it's a longing it's a desire it's what we're used to we have our habits and um hired in, hired in particular is very um tradition heavy there are a lot of things that um are, are challenging so obviously you know a draw to campus a lot of times it could be a football program it can be other things like that too that we're not going to necessarily have um so i'm also you know that's there's some things that are going to be you know change uh, enrollment patterns and things like that, that, you know, if, if we have to be online for any substantial length of time. Um, but another thing is, um, institutionally, the way that we do things, um, for instance, you know, there's been a big push. I mean, for a while there, I think we all heard like, oh, I'm a, I'm a dropout course, and you get, you get a lot of people that are proud to have high attrition things like that and there's obviously been a, a cultural shift away from that i think that people are realizing that's not such a good thing for a lot of reasons whether it's administrative pressure or realizing it on their own or other things too 
uh, hopefully it gets growth. But um, I think that that um, that this this might be a contentious point going forward. I know Matt's done a lot of um, stuff in this space too, of um, this this sort of idea of surveillance and the way that we're looking at metrics and things like that. Um, so we have a lot of people that are really worried about cheating. Is the one thing how we have security and that's still going to continue to be an issue. And then also things like if you're switching online and you have continued poor satisfaction and you have high attrition in certain courses is that going to impact your associate profs your full profs that have been teaching this way for a long time i'm i'm curious if data and things like that start to become a little more weaponized possibly or used in a way that could um be punitive i guess too um, more than what it already has been so um just just some things that are shaking you know the way that the fundamental university structure works. And again, on that on top of, as I said, the tenure and promotion and other things. Uh, I think there are gonna be some other systemic issues we have to deal with that aren't just economic and others. Wow, you guys had so much to say. So this is my, um, the abyss that I'm taking to that George mentioned. Um, you know, there's part of me that's saying what you guys are saying and that I'm very optimistic, like, Yay, like Amy, people are gonna see the potential of online and they're going to keep it. And we're going to see students, like Negan mentioned, taking online and feeling that it's better. Uh, we do know that online learning can be better. Um, I think everyone on this panel here. I think one of, uh, so there's this woman named Janet Falk, love her, at USC for years and years. She has a theory from back in the day called social information processing. Um, and it's this idea that we choose technology based on the objective characteristics. Can it do the job? Often we choose the wrong one, but we also choose it because of social information we have about that technology or that process. And so at the same time as those of us who have been teaching online and or maybe taking courses online, we can see the potential and we know that there's good online um there's a lot of remote instruction i mean that's like from day one let's really clarify what's online learning and what's remote instruction because we know remote instruction could potentially be garbage um and we didn't want that to you know tarnish um you know the already um you know problematic reputation of online learning and you know right away we saw these articles coming out right like fortune magazine it's always like some economist sorry for economists in the room that are experts on online learning that tell us how awful it is even though they've never taught an online class <laughs> or taken an online class um you know and there's like uh and people handpick like one study of you know came up with this therefore all of the seven million online students in the u.s are having bad experiences the problem is, is that there's going to be what we call negative emotional contagion. There are going to be hordes of people, just like Forbes yesterday, that are gonna talk about how, and they already are talking about, how awful their online learning experience is. Um, you know, and so we have, at my university, we're sort of lucky, um, almost half of the students, 11,000 students, already take at least one online course in their college career. There's a couple thousand, probably two or 3,000 that pretty much take only full online courses, but we have a good amount of students that um, don't take online courses. We definitely have faculty that have never, um, in certain departments, have never taught online before. I'm very concerned about the potential of negative emotional contagion on online education and online learning in a field, in particular when we're seeing a backlash of budgets um and cutting and um those sorts of things so although i'm with you guys that there's like that one little evil person over here that's like online learning sucks and now everyone's gonna know um so i'm just worried about that negative emotional contagion going around and that people um you know start thinking that this was online and that just online in general is awful in k-12 and in higher ed i think k-12 is just getting pummeled far more than we are in higher ed. But um, anyways, that is, uh, that's my sort of abyss there. Like everyone, you know, the headline already is how online learning isn't working. Online learning sucks. Um, and it's not online learning. It's just, uh, you know, as I always say, um, and George Valencianos had a really good article out this week or piece he wrote on um, online is superior to face-to-face -to -face or some catchy title like that. 
um, because at the end of the day, you know, there's bad um, face to face and good face to face and bad online and good online. So, anyways, those are my two cents. Great. Well, on that note, we might as well uh, wrap up here. I uh, just want to say thanks to uh, Negan, Matt, Justin, Tanya for uh, your involvement in, in the course. Lots of resources shared. Uh, they'll remain up. I know Matt's got a good chunk of the resources on the website that's shared previously. And we've uh, got a lot of conversations, discussions in the, threat, in the forums in edX that I encourage you all to dive into and contribute to as well. So thanks for your engagement and uh, thanks, like I said, Tanya, Negan, Justin, Matt, for your time in uh, trying to help navigate what this course looks like. So uh, thanks everybody. Hope you have a great rest of your day and uh, enjoy trying to figure out this online environment. Thanks all.